We're just going to do a test stream here. We are broadcasting live from the 9-11 ceremony in Kewaskam. They've got the Legion guys here, the school kids here. It runs pretty deep, but we have a minimal signal here, so I'm just checking to see if that's going to stay with us. Give us a thumbs up or a star if you can. They're going to get underway here shortly. The Haberman family is here. Spoke to Gordon. Gordon and his wife are here. It's a beautiful day. For a solemn experience. Joanne, I see you're here. How's the signal? Fire department is here. We've got a front row seat, so we should be able to hear the speakers pretty well. And the band and the fire department. Supposed to get underway at one o'clock. This live broadcast is brought to you by American Commercial Real Estate. The memorial, if you're not familiar actually, is behind us with the piece of the Twin Tower. That was a large effort to get that here. So let's just keep on broadcasting. Again, the start of a live broadcast, we're going to test our signal here. The 9-11 ceremony in Kewaskam. If you plan on coming out, uh, you're going to have to deal with quite a bit of construction on the main street, Fond du Lac Avenue. So it might be easiest to go the back way and take Oak and then you'll be able to come in on the back end uh, by the golf course, and then easy enough finding parking down there as well. We have the Kewaskam High School band here.
This is the 9-11 Remembrance Event at the Wisconsin 9-11 Memorial and Education Center. Gordon Haberman and Julie Haberman, father and sister of Andrea Lynn Haberman, will be some of the speakers along with Ronaldo Vega and Mike Kenny. Kewaskum High School Band will perform a musical tribute. And American Legion Post 384 uh, is the honor guard today. This live broadcast brought to you by American Commercial Real Estate. So a little grace on this broadcast, we have uh, very few bars for a signal. If we cut out, it is not intentional. Um, we will then uh, videotape it and have a rebroadcast later today at WashingtonCountyInsider.com. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. I'm Fuzz Martin. I'm the president of the board of directors for Kewaskum Remembers 9-11 Inc. That's the nonprofit organization responsible for the operation and maintenance of the Wisconsin 9-11 Memorial and Education Center. I'm also the village president here in Kewaskum. And on behalf of the 9-11 Memorial's board of directors and the village of Kewaskum, I want to say thank you for coming and attending here today as we come together to remember those who were killed on September 11, 2001. Those heroes who emerged in the aftermath of the tragedy and the resilience of our nation. I would like to extend a special welcome to the Hopperman family, to the Freud and Henneberry family, our keynote speakers, Ronaldo Vega and Mike Kenny, and all the veterans and first responders in attendance. Thank you for your continued service and dedication. I'd also like to give a special thank you to our teachers and students in attendance today. This memorial was built for you to help teach future generations. And lastly, I would like to thank our elected officials in attendance. Thank you for supporting 9-11 education in our schools and understanding the importance of spreading the lessons learned on September 11th and in the days and years following the attacks. Today marks our fourth remembrance event since opening the Wisconsin 9-11 Memorial and we're not, only, we're not here to only remember the events of the fateful day, but to ensure that the stories of heroism, sacrifice, and resilience are never forgotten. We are reminded how a single day changed the course of a nation, and we honor the lives that were selfishly taken from us. This memorial is beautiful, yes, and we're all quite proud to have it here in our community, right here in Kewaskum. It stands as a beacon of remembrance and education, but it's also something that none of us should ever take for granted. Every time you see that 2,000 pound piece of steel, you should remember that just 23 years ago today, that very piece of steel was supporting one of the world's most iconic buildings filled with thousands and thousands of innocent lives. People just like you and me who are simply going about their day. 23 years ago today, that building fell around that piece of steel. And then nine years ago, that piece of steel came to Kewaskum. And now it stands here proudly, pointing back directly at its home at Ground Zero. And it will stand here for generations, telling its story for all who see it. So now as we prepare to reflect and remember, I invite all who are able to stand to please do so as Joel Lewin offers our inv invocation. Thank you, Fuzz. Good afternoon. As we gather today in front of this significant monument, we reflect on a day profoundly impacted in our history. September 11th, 2001 is a date etched in our memories 
a moment that shaped our nation and lives. On this anniversary, let us honor not only the lives lost in the tragic events, but also the bravery of those who rushed into danger to help others. The first responders, firefighters, and police officers who selflessly dedicated themselves to saving lives exemplify the spirit of courage and compassion that defines us. This monument serves as a testament to the resilience of the United States, reminding future generations of the sacrifices made by our service men and women who confront danger daily to protect our freedoms and well-beings. I invite you now to bow your heads for a moment of silence to honor those who lost their lives that day and remember the families still affected by their loss. God of peace and mercy, we come before you on this solemn anniversary, lifting up the souls lost on September 11th. Embrace them in your love and comfort, their families and friends. Help us to mourn with compassion and look to, f look to the first responders as examples of bravery and selflessness. May we also remember the kindness shown to those who opened their homes to others in need that day, inspiring us to be more welcoming. As we, com as we confront darkness, May we remain steadfast in seeking your eternal light. Amen. Thank you. And now I'd like to introduce Gordon Haberman and Julie haberman Osmus, the father and sister of Andrea Lynn Haberman, to introduce our keynote speakers. Sadly, those attacks claimed the life of our beloved daughter and sister, Andrea. She was on the 92nd floor of the North Tower of the World Trade Center when the building collapsed. Words and pictures cannot describe the utter, utter devastation that we witnessed as we stood on what became known as Ground Zero. There were hundreds of workers toiling in the horrendous conditions 
involved in the recovery and rescue of those missing. They were searching for victims, all of them, including our Andrea. It became important to us that we meet some of these courageous workers. At Ground Zero, we were able to meet with the General Superintendent of the Recovery Operation to see if we could meet some of these men and women. And a tradition began with our family and continued for 18 years of gathering at a restaurant in the shadows of the missing towers on the evening of every 9-11 anniversary. This group grew to include New York Fire Department, New York Police Department members, engineers, survivors, volunteers, tradesmen, rescue personnel, and members of our armed, our country's armed forces. All had responded and toiled at the wreckage of the trade centers. These annual gatherings became a time for all of us to decompress on each other's and catch up on each other's lives. For our family, these people have become our New York family, and we have forged friendships built on our shared connection to the horrendous attacks of 9-11, which will last our lifetime. It was early in our gatherings that we met our first guest speaker for today, Mr. Rinaldo Vega and Mr. Mike Henney, who are employees of New York City's Department of Design and Construction. Ronald Vega served on the 9-11 Disaster Rescue and Recovery Team at Ground Zero from September 2001 to July 2002. An architect with over 40 years of experience, he later served as the Senior Director of Design for the National 9-11, the National 9-11 Museum and Memorial. He helped to save and nurture the survivor tree, which has been replanted at the National 9-11 Memorial in New York. He has contributed significantly in various memorials, including the Wisconsin 9-11 Memorial. Mike Henney served on the 9-11 Disaster and Rescue Team at Ground Zero from September 2001 to April 2002. As Project Executive for the New York City Department of Design and Construction, he played a key role in recovery programs after Superstorm Sandy, helping to restore 150,000 homes. Mike Henney has also testified before Congress advocating for health care for the Ground Zero workers who toiled at Ground Zero for nine months until the site was cleared. Sadly, another DDC member of our group, Mr. Charles Kaczorowski, succumbed to cancers and diseases caused by his exposure to the toxins at Ground Zero. He attended our meetings until it became physically impossible to do so. Mike and Ron have been supporters of the Wisconsin 9-11 Memorial and Education Center since its inception. We remember well meeting with Ron in New York, going over the blueprints of the Kewaskum Memorial well before construction started. After a lengthy application process, our Wisconsin Memorial was awarded a clone of the survivor pear tree Ron had rescued from Ground Zero by the National 9-11 Museum in New York. My dad was going to drive to New York to pick it up. However, he was informed that because of the COVID restrictions, he would need to be quarantined for two weeks in the city. With help, Ron and Mike said, don't worry, we got it. And they drove it here to the Wisconsin 9-11 Memorial and Education Center. Please welcome my dear friends, Ronaldo Vega and Mike Kenny, as they will speak about their experiences at Ground Zero and beyond. Good 
Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm still trying to figure out how I'm a keynote speaker here today. I'm not worthy. 9-11 um, is, a, is a solemn day. It took place 23 years ago, but for many of us, it's like yesterday. Today's the first time since the attacks on 9-11 that I'm not in New York City. And only the call of a, a native Wisconsin son can make me be here today. It was an honor and a privilege to be a responder to the, to the attacks on 9-11-01, especially since I didn't have to. I had no responsibility or requirement to do so. You see, not all responders wear uniforms. God bless the NYPD and the FTNY. I'm not worthy to touch their feet. I'm just an average city worker who felt compelled to help. I didn't lose anyone on 9-11, but at the same time, I felt like I lost every one of them. With that sense of obligation, Mike and I went there without hesitation, despite the horrors or, or the conditions that we would face. Months upon months of grueling and mental and physical labor was only cushioned by rare moments of kindness and humanity. Michael Patrick Kenny, who I only met at Ground Zero, is now my brother for life. And Kathy and Gordon Haberin, who I met on a cold morning in 2002 on Ground Zero, are now my closest family. I'm here because Andrea Lynn Haberman lived. I'm here because her family are from Wisconsin and they're the first people I ever met from Wisconsin. And now I can't help but think of people of Wisconsin as being the heart of this country, of being such noble people and their thought to, to make this memorial to people who died in New York. Yes, people from Wisconsin died there too, but keep in mind when we first reported to site, we thought it were 50,000 people had died. Thank God much less than that but they were from all over the country and from all over the world. And when Mike and I were working that site, we tried not to get personal because it was just too, too, too hard to work that site and get personal. But when we met Gordian and Kathy, it, it changed for us. From that moment on, we knew we were fighting for, and it's hard to say this, but we were fighting for proof of death. That's important. By the time Mike and I got there, proof of life was kind of like a, only a hope. No one, would, no one else that for, after the first day would, would leave that site alive. So we spent the next months after months trying for proof of death to give some level of comfort to the families who had lost their loved ones. And we did pretty good. We didn't do all we could. We feel like failures because we couldn't find everybody but we did the best we could. So when I was told about this memorial, I was told to, if there was anything I could do to help, you know, the last living thing to leave ground zero was our survivor tree. It was burned, it was destroyed. The Parks Department called it mortally wounded. They had given up on it, but we at DDC did not give up on it. We made sure that she was taken from the site in the dark of night because quite frankly, we couldn't admit to anyone that we cared about a tree more than we cared about their loved ones. So we got that tree put on a flatbed and we took it up to the Bronx and uh, we kind of let it sit there for a while and we went back to our, our hard labor. Uh, years later, I became the director of design for the 9-11 Memorial and Museum. I remembered that tree. I said, I wonder what happened to that tree? It, Pretty much like someone who finds someone hurt on the highway, you put them on an ambulance, you've done your job, right? You don't really follow up on what happened to them. So I was kind of busy, I didn't follow up on what happened to that tree. People had left the city, people who knew about the tree had retired, people had gone out of state, nobody knew where that tree was. And we found that tree in that nursery in the Bronx. And when I saw her, she was the ugliest damn thing I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> and I fell in love with her. So we fought to bring her back, and we got her back. 
and we made her repatriated to her home on Ground Zero. So her being the last living thing to leave Ground Zero and the first thing being planted back at Ground Zero, it was only fitting that her children, her two offspring, would come here to sit on your memorial. So you have the living legacy of the Survivor Tree in New York as part of your, as, as part of your memorial. And I think that's kind of the only thing I could do. It's the best thing I could do. And uh, seeing her here, seeing the two children here, one here at the front, the other one, and uh, kind of giving a nod to that piece of steel that we toiled 10 months around, and now she's here pointing back to New York. I feel like this is a piece of New York here as well. Wisconsin and New York united in our futures and our hopes to go forward. So Gordy, Gordy has asked me to do something that I every do uh, that I do every every 9/11, and um, I thought I was going to hold it pretty good until he mentioned my, our brother Charlie Kay who passed away. So it's with a heavy heart, but I offer this up to you in his memory in memory of all those that died on that horrible day. And I have to say, they were murdered on that horrible day. That's right. And uh, all of those that have died since and are still suffering with the consequences of that day. For those, uh, those that have gone ahead and those that are still with us and suffering, I offer this for them. Oh, Danny boy. The pipes, the pipes are calling From glen to glen And down the mountainside The summer's gone And all the flowers are dying Tis you, tis you Must go and I must bide but come ye back when summer's on the meadow, or when the valley's hushed and white with snow, tis I'll be here in sunshine or in shadow. Ah, oh, Danny boy, ah, oh, Danny boy, I love you so. And when you come, if all the flowers are dying, if I am dead, as dead I well may be, you'll come and find the place where I am lying, and kneel and say an ave there for me. And I shall hear those soft you tread above me. Thank you, Ron. And now, Mike Kenny. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Mike Kenny, and uh, I don't know how to follow that up. Uh, <laughs> that leaves me way down on the bottom here, but uh, I'll try to let you know. Uh, on September 11, 2001, I was working for the city of New York for uh, 15 years already, and uh, what happened was unbelievable for anybody in the city at that time. And uh, I was on Rikers Island, and uh, I went into, uh, we were loading Scott packs and sending them down to the site for the fire department because they had lost so much equipment when the towers came down. And I didn't get home until like late the next morning and uh, the TV antenna was down, but you could get a picture and you could listen on the radio. And that's how I spent the next two days looking at the TV, figuring out, because we were locked out of the city, couldn't get back to the city. So when I finally got back to the city that Friday, they told me that I was detailed down to the site and I was to report on Saturday night. And uh, 
I remember going home and told my wife that uh, I was going to be down at the site, and she was like, what are you going to do down there? And I said, I don't know, but we're going down there and uh, I'll figure it out. And you got to remember, this is back when you had a beeper, that was about it. You know, no cell phone, no cameras. It was, it was just amazing. So that first night, it was like something out of a 1950s movie, you know. We were taking out the bucket brigade, the volunteers, and we were bringing in the tradespeople. And they were shaping up at Jacob Javits, which is 23rd Street, you know, about a mile away from the site. And uh, I finally got down to that site Sunday morning around 4 in the morning. And uh, I had worked in the trade towers. I had worked across the street in the financial center. And I thought I knew it but I didn't know where I was. I was, uh, I was on another planet looking at such destruction that I couldn't even comprehend what was going on. Lost all my bearings and uh, we ended up staying down there like for uh, 72 hours straight through. And uh, that Monday morning I went back to Rikers Island and then that Monday night I went back down to ground zero and you know, my wife didn't see me for a week, you know, and cell phones, towers were down trying to communicate was hard and uh, she didn't know what was going on and I really didn't know what was going on but uh, I ended up spending seven months at the site and uh, what I would like to to relate to these people here is to the young people my daughter was just turning 13th on September 13th and my son was just going to first grade and uh, I walked out of that house my wife became you know, a single parent. I worked the night shift. Uh, by the time I got home, I was able to see them go off to school and then I would crash and I'd be gone before they'd come back. And that's how it was. And we worked in seven days a week in the beginning and then we finally went to six days a week, which was, you know, my, my first day off from work. I ended up at a 9-11 funeral for my wife's cousin who had died from uh, NYFD. And so, you know, I went back and told the guys my first day off, I'm at a funeral. It's like, I can't get away from this. And uh, it was, uh, it just melded together. And we were working around the clock 24 seven. And uh, if you missed the shift, it was like missing a week's worth of work by the time you got back, because so much would happen in the other two shifts. You know, it was go, go, go. It was unbelievable. And when I look back at it, like on a day like today, you know, I could transport myself right back to the first day I was down there. And uh, it, it was anything. But anyway, what I like to talk about is my daughter, 13th, you know, her life changed from, from it. I seen her direction in life change. I seen that uh, she, uh, she went into a military school. She became a Navy architect and she became driven. And before that, she was a girly girl, and I can't say, you know, what made her do it, but a sense of purpose. And my son, you know, he, he told me that he hated first grade. And I asked him why. He says, you're never here. And I said, well, I'll be here soon enough. So uh, I stayed at the site until the end of April, middle of April. I got hurt, and I left the site pretty banged up and pretty sick. And, uh, you know, uh, I knew it. You know, I went back to work September of 2022 when I was healthy enough to go back to work, but I still was still not feeling good. And I got involved with my union. I got involved with uh, going down to Congress and trying to get some kind of health care benefits <coughs> for us, some kind of, uh, you know, victim compensation fund and all that. I made over 40 trips to Washington, walked the halls, and that was a whole nother thing. And while I was doing all this, I was watching my kids grow up and watching their lives change because of it. And all I can say is, you know, on September 10th, I was a jaded New Yorker. You know what I mean? I was that kind of guy that probably gave that rap throughout America, New Yorkers. You don't want to deal with them. But after September 11, we all became America for the first time in my life and proud to be Americans and the honor and you know for for me being down there there was another hundred people that would have gladly took my spot they would have they would have traded any day with it and uh you know the, the 
the stuff that we had to go through and what we had to do down there, it bonded us. Uh, there was like 60 real tight-knit DDCers that were down there. 22 of us are already passed away. And uh, they, weren't in, they weren't in pleasant deaths. They were very painful deaths. And some of them very, way too young. And it's still happening. And all I can say is that when you're called into something, just go in it and try to do the best you can do. You never know what opportunities will arise from it. And you're going about your every day, but there's so many things you can do. And as a young person, you know, I don't want just to forget. And, uh, you know, we, we, we witnessed it, we lived it, but you know what? It, it, was, it was pure destruction the seven months I was down there. And uh, all I can say is that um, it changed my life. You know, uh, fast forward 23 years from there, my, my daughter got married. She has two beautiful kids. Her father-in-law, my future father-in-law, he worked down there as a police officer. I didn't know him at the time. We. I'd like to thank our speakers and our uh, the Kewaskum High School Band and uh, Mr. McLeague for making this happen. And now we will have military honors from the American Legion Post 384. Just uh, please know there will be some shots so, if, uh, so the students are aware that there will be some loud noises. <laughs> Thank you.